um, I'm Linda. Uh, next to me, like later in the screen, you'll see Gabriela and Dario. And um, yeah, we didn't really have a paper uh, to criticize or to like examine critically. Um, so we kind of went our own way with just highlighting uh, topics that we found interesting to discuss about this mechanism. Um, where do I click to here? Ah, perfect. It's working. I'll just continue. I'll start with a, a, a very small summary of um, the system itself, just because there's a lot of abbreviations and it can get confusing pretty fast. Uh, then I will uh, talk a bit about the historical and political context of this system, which is relatively new. So we thought it would be interesting to get into that. Um, then Dario is going to uh, mention a few topics uh, within the governance and scope of the system as it currently works. And Gabriela will um, close off with uh, some challenges that we foresee in the medium run. <laughs> And uh, uh, yeah, some of them are were already uh, commented on by the presenter. Yeah. So just to clarify and uh, summarize, the banking union, as I understood it, it's not necessarily a existing reality. It's more like a goal that uh, the European is European Union is striving for. Um, and then within this fully integrated system, which should be in in the future realized, uh, there are like three different pillars. Um, the first one is the one that we are focusing on today, the supervisory mechanism, which basically uh, is in action all the time supervising banks. The second one comes into play when a bank is in danger and needs to be uh, somehow helped. It's partly also financed through uh, uh, contributions by private banks. And then the last pillar, which is one thing that Dario will also comment on more, it's, uh, it depends on insurances of, of people who deposit their money at the bank. Um, and the principle of the banking union is that they all fall under a, a single rule book that is uh, consistent throughout uh, the European Union. And as mentioned before, it only um, really started working in 2014. So it's a pretty recent system. I put a stupid joke to see if people were still listening. <laughs> and now everybody's listening. Um, <laughs> so just to comment on um, on like the the situation in which the system arise, which was actually uh, in response to the uh, crisis. And it's important to note that because it is still an evolving system. It's partly uh, uh, like a repair for the crisis, but also installed to, to make sure that uh, we see these crises uh, forthcoming uh, in the future before they happen. And um, in like the, the foundational text uh, of the system, uh, they mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, there's now a little thing before, but that the banking union is designed to, to, um, to prevent a sort of vicious cycle between uh, sovereign debt and, and uh, bank risk, which is also called the EU doom loop. That's why the stupid emo joke. Uh, <laughs> And um, then some of the uh, literature that we found about like the, the uh, political uh, tensions around this moment, uh, they highlighted that in times of crisis, uh, which are happening, um, basically an analysis of the crisis is that there were different national crises that then started uh, uh, reinforcing themselves on the EU level. And then uh, the solution that was presented by the EU was basically um, that supervision should also be integrated so that because it's a systemic crisis, we should also design uh, institutions that are on this same level. And then uh, uh, these two writers uh, analyzed how different uh, institutions within uh, the EU level uh, were considered to house this new uh, supervisory mechanism and uh, that the central bank was in the end the, the policy entrepreneur that made the best or like that somehow was chosen to house this new uh, supervisory system. And this is actually quite interesting because then, as we saw also in the presentation, now monetary policy and banking supervision are in the same institution, although it is disputed how connected they are. Um, we found it interesting to to apply it to like the other very big crisis that we've lived in our lifetime, which was the 2020 COVID crisis. And there was uh, one paper that we found that claimed that 
uh, not only did the monetary policy side of the ECB function uh, more proactively in this crisis, which uh, shortened the length of the of the economic crisis and and reduced the the real economic consequences, they also highlighted that because the uh, supervisory instruments could become more lenient in this crisis, uh, the supervisory side of the ECB mandate also uh, helped to get us out of the crisis quicker. So arguably, um, there is there is more there is a positive side to this integration in in the ECB. Uh, but the questions that we would like to present to the speaker is, yeah, I don't know. This was probably before your time, but maybe you can uh, share your opinion on it. Uh, we were just wondering why the central bank was chosen uh, to become like to have the mandate of the SSM and not the European Commission or the Banking Authority, which were two other institutions that were mentioned that could also uh, get this mandate. And then also like what happens if there is a conflict of interest between uh, monetary policy and supervision? Um, how do you navigate that within a single uh, institution? And now I'll hand it over to Dario. So I'm going to focus more on some issues related to, yeah, I need access to the laptop, uh, uh, of governance and mainly of scope of the uh, ECB and the, the European Central Bank and the uh, supervision, European supervision. Uh, we said that two main pillars of the uh, banking union have been realized. What it's missing uh, today, it's... Uh, single deposit insurance scheme what is uh, an insurance scheme make it really really easy it's a uh, an insurance that uh, guarantees that if your bank fails uh, your deposit uh, are safe uh, at least up to a certain level um, today all european union countries uh, need to have one national deposit insurance scheme uh, that covers up to 100,000 euro for each depositor, but there is no European unique scheme. And this was one of the objectives of the of the supervisory board of this of this period. So as you can see from that um, uh, quote, uh, they really wanted to achieve it, to achieve this uh, complete completing this union uh, before 2024. And Today, the talks, the discussion is uh, mainly on this. Yeah, you cannot read it, but on, that's me. Uh, the discussion is on, the, uh, on, on a proposal from the European Commission to reform the framework that, um, uh, on, uh, on bank crisis. Uh, but uh, the European Commission that had the objective still to harmonize and to reduce uh, the risks and to reduce, uh, like to reinforce these uh, schemes, the insurance schemes. Uh, still, it's, it seems that it didn't really uh, fully back up the idea of having a, a European a single uh, insurance scheme. So my question, my first question for you is, how important is to, to have such uh, a mechanism to conclude the banking union? And if it's still credible, to have it in the next years, or it's something we should expect in, uh, in more longer terms. Uh, then I would like to focus on some elements relative to countries that have not adopted the Euro and that are still in the European Union or that are in Europe. So uh, specifically um, today, you said it uh, already, you, countries of the European Union that are, don't, don't have Euro can create some closer cooperation agreement with the European Central Bank. Right now, only Bulgaria, because Bulgaria is in the process of uh, getting the euro inside the euro. Also, Croatia uh, was in such an agreement up to last year, uh, and now it's completely fully integrated in the euro. But some uh, analysis and some uh, studies focus on how much so uh, smaller European countries and countries of the European Union that are not in the Euro, are their financial systems are strongly connected to the European. The small countries often uh, see in their financial markets, in their, in their um, banking systems, 
the um, the multinational uh, European Union multinational banks uh, and their subsidiaries playing an important role. So there are some studies uh, and some suggestions to uh, integrate more and to to uh, integrate more and to uh, enlarge the the status and the and the supervision to both European Union countries that do not have euro, but also to uh, integrate more European countries that are not even in the European Union. So how do you feel about this? How uh, and, do, and do you think that this close cooperation agreement is only um, a tool for further integrate countries going towards adopting euro or can it be something also for uh, useful for countries that do, do not want to adopt euro, at least right now? And last thing that I will talk about and then we're going to get more into the technicalities with Gabriela on how is this uh, done and some uh, specific elements. So um, shadow banking, uh, just to make, to give you a very, very quick, brief idea, uh, all those uh, institutions that are non, not banks, but behave similarly to banks. So they engage in maturity transformation, in borrowing short and uh, lending long-term. Uh, but that usually are less uh, supervised, and that has been a problem. Uh, for example, in the 2008, I'm really sorry, 2008 financial crisis. Um, here we see in this graph uh, the, that in European Union has grown the shadow banking system, and the European Central Bank uh, states that the, this significant bank the significant banks of european union are exposed to uh, liquidity market and credit risks because engage because they are engaging with the um, with the they're connected to the to the shadow bank system and in particular the nine percent of their assets is uh, exposed to to risk re coming from the shadow banking system um, and we were wondering uh, two things one what does this nine percent mean uh, how how exposed are they and to, to potential risk coming from the shadow banking systems? And why, this is one, and why are uh, these kind of institutions left to national authorities and national supervision and they are not in, they're not supervised at the unique European level? I leave the word to Gabriela. Okay, thank you. Uh, for this last part, we wanted to reflect a bit in the structural medium-term challenges that are identified as priorities by the European Central Bank. First, we wanted to talk about climate-related and environmental risk, and also about digital transformation that is uh, identified as a priority. Uh, for starting, as you mentioned, there are some risks that we can categorize in three a kind of risk. <laughs> First, the physical risks are the ones that are concerned to the damage in the infrastructure when there is like a climate shock. There is transition risks that are concerned to the potential loss of value of firms and assets because of the low carbon economic transition. And here we want, we really found this interesting in the climate risk stress test. Uh, there is approximately 60% of the share of the interest income um, related to the 22 most gas emitting industries that has the bank. So this is showing a, a very high risk in, in this in these ones. And also there are liability risks that are the ones associated when a third party are seeking for compensation because of damage of a climate shock. And because the European, the European Central Bank is uh, applying climate into the regulations, this is one area that we found that is having the divergency with US and uh, with the Fed. Um, here in this graph, we also find interesting uh, since when the European Central Bank is having conversations about uh, incorporating climate change risk uh, into the banks and when they start also uh, putting some norms and proactive norms while in US uh, they just start talking about it in 2019 so we found it really interesting and also we found that 
uh, the European Central Bank is in the top five of this oh, of this rank. That is the Green Central Bank in a score uh, card that basically uh, ranks. Uh, about the green policies that central banks are taking in the G20 countries. And here we found in the priorities by the European Central Bank uh, a timeline that they were requiring by March of last year. Uh, they were expecting banks to categorize climate and environmental risks, as you mentioned. Uh, then they were expecting that by the end of the year, they were going to incorporate this risk in their governance strategy and risk management. And by this year, uh, they were expecting to um, to get to align to the good practices that the European Central Bank identifies in 2020. But here we find interesting because we found this news that they were saying that not all banks accomplish with this uh, with these requirements. So here we wanted to ask you, how do you feel banks were reacting to incorporating climate and environmental risk uh, into their into their governance? And if you feel that they are kind of skeptical with disclose some information, maybe. And we also found some suggestions by some organizations. Uh, for example, Reclaim Finance says that uh, the European Central Bank is not um, supporting to, to cut the support to minor polluters, and, and also that the European Central Bank could make uh, more uh, or take more action to lower the cost of capital for green investment. And in this aspect, is behind the central banks of China and Japan, and they were proposing dual rates for a green uh, lending facility that they could take the same uh, technique that they took uh, during the COVID-19. And another recommendation that we found by Climate Transparency, we're saying that central bank can add a green supporting factor or a dirty penalizing factor to capital and liquidity requirements. So basically banks that have a lot of investment in um, gas emission industries uh, we're going to have like higher capital and liquidity requirements and this is going to incentivize uh, green investment so we also were interested in what are your opinion about this kind of policies and then we take the challenges or risk identified by european central bank about digital transformation the first one is about the strategic and execution of applying digital tools into the banks uh, then about cyber attacks and data security, that is a huge risk uh, recently. Uh, we also find interesting that in this year they will launch the first cyber attack stress test. And we wanted to ask you um, if the European Central Bank identified good practices for running cyber attack stress test. And also another risk is about third party dependency and money laundering and fraud. And then we summarize all the question in this last slide. Thank you very much. Okay, th thank you. Maybe you can uh, you can comment a little bit on on these questions, answer those questions, and then uh, and then we'll take a few. Up, sorry, I will up the slides are here. Just trying to to bigger here. Okay, fine. Okay. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for for the presentation and these really good questions. Um, I mean, I was expecting uh, to have good questions and, and challenges, but really, some things you identified are really on the spot, uh, and really exactly that's that's the whole point. So let me go maybe through the questions also how uh, how I noted them down. Um, there was a. Uh, a question on on also monetary policy and supervision in the same institution so starting from um from the first speaker i'm sorry like on i'm really like i had the note down the name linda oh, linda linda exactly um in the same institution and in terms of conflict of interest and what it could create um i mean that was what what i said not really with these chinese walls and not having the exchange and so on because of course it can create conflict of interest um if um on the monetary policy side there are uh, changing interest rates in order to ensure uh, banks are, for example, providing more financing to the uh, organization and are maybe taking sufficient, taking higher risks. Uh, but uh, we, on the other side, of course, are very prudent on, 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 on not, the banks not taking too many risks. Um, 
it is really separated and honestly from my experience um nothing really goes goes through there i mean also in terms of it processes and everything we have in place um i don't see how um in it, let's say a conflict of interest that can be existent in the same institution can hamper really anything of the execution also what you have to keep in mind i mean as a public institution the mandate you have you're super reliant on um on on trust on public trust and the um yeah people trusting that you fulfill your mandate so if you do something that undermines credibility in the institution that's really really a big uh, big deal and especially as, as as something like the european central bank um there was also a question then on on COVID and the track record to, to get us quicker out of the out of the question i think so to be honest um i think it was very good i found it very interesting what you said that that really showed that actually supervision had a benefit and that the whole integration, all the efforts that have been done in order to harmonize um, and integrate supervision on a European level actually pays off. I mean, I think the reaction time is really quick because it's all in-house and we have some experts and usually then they come towards us, say, look, this is what we want you to engage with the banks on a very quick basis. And then within a few days, usually we also get the analysis from the bank that's aggregated um, at the institution level. So to have a full picture on the financial industry where they are standing, um, and how they plan to manage the crisis. Um, and um, that's also with COVID, but also we've seen this last year, um, Silicon Valley Bank, um, things like that. No, whenever there are hiccups in the financial system or Credit Suisse, um, and, and, and there might be potential implications also to other European to, or to European institutions, um, there's a very quick reaction time um, to get to the bank, have a quick dialogue um, and, and use the information internally um, to see uh, where the system is standing and, and if there might be a threat to stability overall. Um, the uh, Why was the ECB chosen for supervision? To be very honest, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah, of course, I think it could have been given to different institutions. However, I was personally always an advocate to give it also to the central bank because I think um, the responsibility for overall financial stability should be at a central bank and in terms of having there an issue with the mandates that's exactly what you can tackle you have different even if you have different mandates you can have different tools in order to meet these mandates um and uh, and that is 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 fine so um I think the benefit, without knowing that why exactly it was chosen, um, I think the benefit really is that you have an institution where it could relatively quickly being ramped up a, a team when aggregating and bringing people in from the different national authorities because the connection was already there. I mean, the central bank already had a lot of interaction with the different national banks. Um, so also here bringing people then to Frankfurt uh, and saying now, you do supervision on a European level because essentially the first staff in the SSM were supervisors from the national levels. Um, there was was quite quickly possible, um, and then there was a lot of rounds of hiring until I'd say eighteen, nineteen. I think we have been like fully staffed. Um, we do in case of. Um, yeah, I think I addressed the point on potential conflict of interest. Um, the um exactly the, the second um one i think that dario um in terms uh, you asked the question on deposit insurance scheme uh, yes joint deposit insurance is super important and it's exactly it's exactly the point what is lacking i mean the banking union you're fully right um is, uh, is something to strive for it's not fully there um I think it is important to have it jointly uh, within the european union because um whenever if you want banks to work in different countries to be able to upstream also capital, let's say a, a, a bank works in the case of what we what I supervise now, that it's a Dutch bank, but they also work in Germany and they collect, for example, a lot of funds in Germany. So a lot of savings are deposited uh, in, in German accounts with that bank. They also want to use that liquidity in order to make business in other countries. And in order to have really, um, yeah, it, the possibility to, um, easily upstream um upstream liquidity and use it everywhere and to to be quite efficient 
you need a joint deposit insurance scheme because otherwise Germany will always come around, let's say the competent authorities in Germany and say, no, 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 that liquidity we expect to stay in Germany because if something happens to the bank, then of course we want the bank to be able to fulfill their obligations with the people who deposited that money. So there's a lot of, and that's to your second question, how realistic is it to, to be implemented soon? I think we're here exactly at the point where there's a lot of national interests um, still, and every country or many countries in Europe are still very much in the mindset of, you know, we want to ensure that, of course, our citizens or our people living in our country who deposited the money with the banks here get always the money first. Um, so if that if they deposit in Germany, for example, the money with a Dutch bank and that Dutch bank has issues, we don't want... Um, them maybe help, helping or bailing out, for example, Dutch customers first, and then there's nothing left for the Germans. So in that sense, there's a lot of protectionism uh, on the local level. Uh, and that's also why they don't want this full deposit insurance scheme, um, because there's, there's simply uh, feelings that, you know, it wouldn't work on a joint European level. And at some point, if um, things turn down, then um, yeah, a certain prioritization has to be put in place. Um, by the way, that's the same kind of discussions which we have also with non-European or non-Euro countries, um, namely also like in Poland or Romania um, that are very protective as well um, and where rules for banks are also quite difficult if they want to operate um, in these countries. Um, that brings me to your second question, close cooperation um, with other countries. Yes, I think that close cooperation is super important. I mean, with Bulgaria, we have this now. We've had it as well, as you rightly said, uh, with Croatia. Um, what we have in place, you mentioned it as well on your slide, is these colleges. Um, and the colleges work the way that, um, I mean, there's simply regular contact between the supervisors um, from, from the Euro countries. Um, on a European level, so I think there's more, I mean, the college is the, the closer cooperation. On the EU level, um, that means, for example, countries like uh, like Poland, Romania, Hungary, um, just to name some, um, with them we have a lot closer cooperation and we also take joint decisions. So any requirement we have towards the bank that is operating, to stay with the example also in Poland, the Polish authority, the KNF, will also sign that joint decision, which means that it's also applicable for the Polish entity. Um, However, I mean, you also asked the question outside EU cooperation. Um, I mean, for countries outside of the EU, they are part of a college as well. So we usually have a European college and then we have an international or non-European college. So authorities, for example, um, we have in our college for ING, also um, the authorities from Australia, from Singapore, from, uh, let, me, let me think, who else? Singapore, uh, Taiwan? No, 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 no. We have, yeah. So, but these countries, we had China as well, um, and that depends a little bit on the cooperation in general, uh, on the on the confidence. That's an assessment that Eva is doing. Um, but for countries that are assessed to be equivalent in terms of confidentiality, um, they can be asked to join a college and they get the observer status. So at least once a year, we have a regular meeting with them and we do exchange on the view that they have on the bank activities uh, in their countries and, uh, and what we have. In our case, for example, with Australia, we have even closer cooperation because the bank has a quite, um, quite big portfolio there and we just want to understand um, also the risks uh, in that area. Um, so yes, cooperation is super important in and outside EU. Um, and that I think is is in short and quite there's a lot of regulation that's really really detailed. Um, to come to the other questions, then uh, shadow banking. Yes, shadow banking is a huge point. I remember when I was still in the in the in the epoch course, I was always I was a bit obsessed with shadow banking because I said like well, how can it be that there uh, that there's no like they they're not regulated and the risks coming from all this air in this. Um, why these institutions not supervised? To be honest. I don't know. I, th I think it's simply really difficult to put rules on it. And because they're not officially, like legally institutions that are very easy to also name, because I mean, in case of a bank, you apply for a banking license, right? You know, everybody knows this is a bank. So you can say, if you're a bank, you're supervised. Um, for um, shadow banks, I mean, that can be all kind of corporate um constructions that are quite difficult to grasp and to analyze. So where do you where do you start the application? So do you supervise actually on 
institution level, and I think here we come to it to discussion, would it maybe be better to supervise um, actions? So to supervise um, financial strains and what is happening overall in the financial industry and not focus so much on legal institutions. I think that's something also possible to discuss, um, but uh, but the, yeah, um, I think one of the reasons then why they're not supervised is because it's it's really difficult to define also what what shadow, shadow banking in the end uh, really means and and what institutions would fall under that. Um, nine percent exposure to um so banks are nine to nine percent uh, exposed um, to to shadow banks. Yes, that's something, and um, I think we do pay attention some to it, but it's also not huge. I mean, if you put it in relation. There are many other risks we pay more attention to, um, and that's really the traditional standard portfolios, uh, if that maybe as a mortgage book or whatever, um, which is really to other normal normal customers or corporations. So that's also what banks make most of their money on. Um, however, I think there's probably a difference between different banks. Um, there some of the big institutions, international institutions that are also much more active in capital markets, for them, the risk might be higher, while for some more tra traditional institutions that lend to corporations or even retail customers, the, the, the risk might be much lower. Um, so um, it's probably good to make here a difference between the different banks and then apply and, and see where the risks are coming from. Um, that on shadow banking climate, um, banks, to be honest, super on point um, to ask uh, really what the reaction is to banks on the decisions we imposed. And I think also the citations we had here from, from news articles or Frank uh, Frank Elderson's speech. Um, yeah, there's a lot of pushback. Um, there's a lot of pushback from the financial industry. Um, there is all kind of lobbying efforts that you can imagine being done uh, from the financial industry in terms of why did we step up the approach so much on climate? Um, because to be very honest, it is also a bit of a change of supervisory approach. I think in the past, when we ever reissued a guidance uh, or an expectation, so at the industry, we always gave them quite some time implementing it, saying, you have time, let's do a review, let's do some recommendations, let's have a talk again. Um, so with climate, actually, the guide is from 2020, um, and we now in 2022, only not or not even two years after, we issued for some banks that really did not make sufficient progress, uh, decisions telling them, look, this is your last warning short, uh, shot, uh, if you don't comply, you need to pay. Um, and I think that's probably the, like, yeah, the toughest measure we, we have available and, and where we are very quick. Um, very much many things are driven by also Frank Elderson, who is our vice chair, um, who came in and he's very active on this topic. He's part of the um, international network of central banks of greening the financial system and so on. So um, he he really pushes the topic. Um, and that means, however, it's really a pushback. I mean, it's from our side, um, but also from the financial industry. Um, that, of course, because they say, look, we're doing everything. I mean, um, I know for many banks that tell us we do everything, we have everything in place. Now, what more do you want us to do? Like, we also need certain time. We don't have certain data available. So some sympathy I do have for the industry. At the same time, the topic is so burning um, that uh, we just don't have 10 years to go down the road and say, OK, let's see what happens. So um, therefore, therefore, that approach. Um, my opinion on, on, on really having also policies to provide incentives to finance more green, yes, uh, I, I know about those kind of suggestions. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, my own view very much also, um, I think, yes, for sure, that's something possible to do. Um, I think that's very much, however, though, also the discussion on the central banking side um, of, the, um, of the ECB um, or on the monetary policy side. And um, I think there's still a bit of reluctance because also to, to really see, are we overstepping? Because you always need to make sure, are we still fulfilling the mandate? Are we not overstepping? Are we giving here prefer preferential treatment for some areas um, or preferential treatment for some banks? Um, I mean, everybody's supposed to, or like changing the market in a certain direction. Um, because of course you would change the market in a in a direction or or have incentives because of a certain political stance also and and, and taking an opinion there. 
Um, and they, not everybody's taking that. I think especially on the legal side, there's quite a lot of concerns um, that it would be overstepping of what, uh, what the central bank is allowed to do and how policies are allowed to be designed. Um, digitalization, there was uh, some, I'm looking at this slide now. Um, remind me, I'm sorry, on the, on the last questions, um, I didn't note them down on digitalization. It's a bit too quick. Gabriela, I think, was you now? Yes, exactly here. Yes. Ah, yes, I see the slide. Great. Uh, yes, exactly. So we'll we'll have the first cyber stress test this year. Um, good practices for running cyber attack stress tests. And um, I'm pretty sure if in the context of these stress tests, we always identify good practices. Um, so I think when the stress test is over, usually the ECB issues a report in the end with the main outcoming outcomes. Um, and also with identified good practices um, in the banks. So um, if you're really interested in the topic, keep an eye out. Um, it should be probably towards end of the year. They expect October, November latest um, to have such a report where, where these good practices would be identified um, from different banks, because at least that's what we did in 2022 for the climate stress test, um, where the, the methodology was similar. Okay, I hope I covered everything. I'm not sure if I missed anything. <laughs> thanks, thanks, let me know. <laughs> so we'll take questions from the from the audience. Uh, Dries from Belgium. Um, I have a short, but probably, I don't know, um, difficult question. I don't know. Um, is there a difference in supervision when assuming uh, exogenous or endogenous money? <laughs> Yes, you can answer. <laughs> good, good question. Uh, no, <laughs> easy answer. No, there's no difference um, because essentially, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't think I've ever met anyone in the ECB really thinking and talking about this. So, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, if we, we, if we care about the assets and the liability that the bank has, that's what's on their balance sheet. And yeah, how it gets there, that's a different story. <laughs> Hello, Caroline from Germany. Um, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, because you mentioned that if the if the banks that you're supervising don't follow the guidance that you're issuing, that there are sanctions that you can then put in place. And I was wondering, how how do you proceed with that? And what are the sanctions that you can actually put in place? Because I was I was thinking, I mean, obviously, if you put sanctions on a bank, there are clients and like households and businesses relying on that bank so there's if you if you yeah. put the sanction in place with the aim of stabilizing the system there is this risk that you actually end up destabilizing the system in a way um yeah so so how do you approach that i guess it's a very fine line to walk mm -hmm. you're right it's a fine line um of course there are there are ways in place to ensure that the fine is not so high that it really threatens the bank or it really creates a big uh, problem for them, but at the same time, it costs a bit and it hurts a bit uh, financially. So um, how does the sanction, for example, look like? For example, we have these permanent uh, penalties, um, which means that every day, so in the decision you would typically issue then saying every day the bank is not compliant, a certain percentage of their earnings um, is part of the fine. So it's always dependent also on the situation of the bank. Um, and then uh, if they, for example, don't remediate issues by one month, by two months, half a year, whatever. On a daily basis, um, they would have to pay, and that's then calculated. How the process really works, how they pay, uh, so I, I don't know. I'm not in the details. Um, but that would be one example um, how a sanction could be designed. Sorry, just one follow up. Yeah. Um, sure. How how often does this actually happen? Like, how big of an issue is this? How often do you have to actually put sanctions in place? Um, to be very frank, um, I think it hasn't been used so much in the past um, because uh, also there was always this way of, you know, we do a lot of more restoration and, and talking to the bank and finding a way because in the end, I mean, you want them to really understand it's also for their own benefit to do something because in general, if they do something for the supervisor, then it's not really implemented very much in the bank. Um, 
However, what we've seen now, for example, especially on climate, that approach is changing. Um, so we have more, um, also I think due to the maturity of the SSM, I mean, we're now 10 years in, um, there was, there's more consistency, there's a bit more confidence also on what we can do and what topics we want to push. And where really topics are selected to say, this is where we want to push the industry and have an impact. And then you use the whole escalation framework with sanctions in the end. Um, and I think for climate, really, this is the first time um, we're using that whole letter. Hello, my name is Max and uh, I'm also from Germany. I okay. wanted to ask like whether um, also supervising, like, like if you do supervision, do you also have a view on like illicit flows of funds? Because as as we all know, there are like a handful of banks who are who don't do due diligence and who have big problems with like money laundering, mm -hmm. flows of money from organized crime, yeah. and so on. And uh, like where where is like the border between banking supervision and law enforcement? Like, do you mm -hmm. is there a department where you like also look at these yeah. kind of flow of funds? Very good question. And also something I think where the SSM had to find itself because it wasn't really clearly defined from the beginning. Um, the um, there's I mean, there's anti money laundering authorities in every country. So that's very much of a national authority or a national competence to supervise that and also to find there if banks are not in line. Um, that's in many countries also allocated at the central banks or in some department related to the Ministry of Finance. Um, and what we came across is that um, there's, however, a lot of interaction because we, of course, look at the processes that the banks have in place, for example, the compliance function, that they're sufficiently staffed, that they make, that all the processes are in place. Um, so also know your customer processes and so on. So we do assess that. However, the anti-money laundering authorities have the competence to issue fines and, 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 and issues. I mean, we just assess it in terms of, is this not sufficiently taken into account so it would require to have higher capital. Um, what we've seen and what we have, actually, we do have something like AML colleges, so something like anti-money laundering colleges, where all authorities from the different countries that the bank is operating in are also getting together and, uh, and sharing their assessments in order to understand where the bank is standing. And uh, there, of course, then also the ECB is present um, with the information that we have. So there is a lot more exchange. Again, it, it adds an additional level, le level of complexity and of cooperation. Um, but nevertheless, we take it into account also if certain um, sanctions are issued and, um, and proceedings are done in different countries in, in our assessment. But yes, the line is very fine. Um, and I mean, legally, that's usually where we have a lot of exchange with the lawyers when they say, okay, what can you reason in your decisions that you issue and what is not part of, of our official competence? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Philip. I'm again from Germany. Um, there's a lot of Germans um, in the group, yeah, or maybe that's just the probably <laughs> most German. So, um, yeah, thank you for your talk. It's really interesting to see where all the epoch alumni are ending up. And mm -hmm. uh, my question is exactly regarding that. So, you already said to Dries' question that you probably now don't have to talk about uh, endogenous money anymore and I don't know mm -hmm. uh, all this stuff you learned in epoch so how to how do you deal with that that you had like a really big had really big discussions about heterodox uh, economics mm -hmm. in in your master and now are an institution that is not really in does ah. not really have that or I I, I think that uh, internally you don't really have these big discussions. So no. um, how do you deal with that? Are you quite happy about that? Or do you think, uh, yeah, you missed something? So Yeah. No, good good Sorry. question. Um, I was super, um, I remember also when I joined Epoch, I was really passionate and about all these things that I learned because I had no clue now about the heterodox economics before. And uh, I mean, it's different. And we were also the first cohort. So I think we were also recruited in a bit, bit different than, than some of you guys. Um, and and I really loved the engagement we had, especially with the other students and everything I learned. Um, however, I've also been super practical always. I mean, I had I have come originally from the private industry, and so I just want to you know hands on do things and and ideally have an impact. And that is what I can currently have with the job I'm doing. So I'm really happy with what what I do. Um, as I already mentioned, you do get exposure to talk to people in the banks that is that are 
senior and, and that's quite cool. Um, you can, as a junior person, tell them a bit what they should do. So that's also nice. Um, also, we're given a lot of freedom actually on, on how we do supervision. So do you want an additional meeting? Um, what do you want to impose? What's your, so it's a lot of also strategic thinking um, and, and, and that freedom is quite nice. And I think that's not really normal to a public institution. A lot of times there's a lot of checklisting. Okay, and the process is very standardized. Um, however, that doesn't mean, I mean, to come back a bit to your question, you said, yeah, the exchange you have with people around you, of course, with the people or the colleagues I talk to, some don't even have an economics background. So then, yeah, they like, no, no clue. <laughs> also. Um, and, and the ones who do, um, they maybe don't know about heterodox economics and about the different schools of thoughts and, and, and different ideas. However, they offer sometimes also different perspective. And I think um, what I also liked with Epoch is that, I mean, you have people with these different backgrounds and also from different countries. Um, and you don't always have to, I don't know, believe in certain things, but you can just say, okay, you know, that person has a certain experience and a certain perspective to something because they lived something different or they have a different job experience and whatever. And that's still super enriching. Um, so I think the discussions also have with colleagues, I mean, it can be on job topics, but also different topics um, is super cool because just like everybody has like a quite interesting CV and uh, have for sure international experience, studied at different places, worked at different places. So um, that is what I enjoy. and. and, and what I still like and to be honest I just ran um also just uh, I met oh, I know I have to see it. he has name maybe David you can help me out there's another ebook student who's doing a traineeship at the moment Christopher Heuser I think um who was part of last year's cohort so you also maybe run actually into <laughs> into ebook in, at the ECB already so I think it's the two of us for the moment but yeah um good night my name is Camila from Peru uh, I know that uh, I don't know. I believe. Yeah, I uh, my name is Camila from Peru, and mm -hmm. I know that uh, at that at the regional level, sometimes uh, from my region, it tends to be praised that uh, that in the institutionalism at regional level tends to be fine. However, I know that at the European Union there is a debate about it because I mean there are some uh, groups that they tend to think like oh the European Union tend to be dominated by one country but the other they are just like considered that is an, a positive side like consider taking into account that there is just a in a regional level but I know that I don't know if at another uh, in continents or another regional level there are some initiatives like the European Bank because sometimes like reaching that level tends to be a little bit difficult mm -hmm. So if I understand your question if right, I, then, if I remember correctly, you have you, you know quite well Peru. I know quite well. Yes, my husband is from <laughs> Peru, so we'll go. Actually, I will go again in March. So I know Peru quite well. Um, and so if I understand your question right, it's more um, asking if there are other initiatives like to to consolidate banking supervision. Okay. Um, to be honest. I don't know. I mean, um, for the European level, I'm, I'm very much into the details. Um, I, for especially, for example, for South America, I, I think. I mean, there, I think it's very much still really left to the national authorities to do this. Um, but I'm not aware of any talks that are happening to do this. From experience here, I mean, also the push here in Europe came because of the crisis. Usually, crises are the greatest opportunity there um, in order to change institutional setups. And I'm. My firm belief is really that it actually needs a crisis to change how things are done when institutions are set up because mandates and, and really are not given or not changed just by a normal process. I think it really needs a trigger from outside to then say um, we, we do change how we how we do certain practices. So I hope not a big crisis happens, but if it does, I think there's also always the opportunity to maybe then review frameworks and, and, and give mandates to different institutions and do something like of a consolidation. Hello. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, Zilola. <laughs> I'm Zilola, I'm from Uzbekistan. And my question related to recent growth uh, of Neobank, Digital Bank, and most important, FinTech. Well, uh, as we know, um, fintech firms are providing full range of banking services, avoiding bank-related requirements such as deposit, uh, loan ratio, assets, liquidity, and etc. So my question is, is there uh, upcoming uh, 
requirements by Basel or European Central Banks for fintech firm that are similar to uh, bank requirements. And my another question would be uh, regarding fintech firms that based in Europe, but providing their service outside of Europe. Because uh, in Europe, there are still strict regulations for data uh, and etc. But outside, there is no and uh, fintech Europe based fintech firms uh, are able to do the data driven decisions and how this regulation is done. Yeah, great question. I mean, fintechs, I mean, that's really a big topic of um, because essentially they put a threat really to the financial industry. I mean, with the business model that they have and what they how they service customers, um, there is a lot of competition. Um, the um, in terms of regulating and if there are any plans to put the same strict rules uh, to to fintechs as for banks, I'm not aware of and um, I don't I mean, for the moment. I don't think, I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of regulation as well. And many fintechs also, when they become big enough, when they start applying then for a bank license, of course, then they would be subject to the same. Um, but um, if it's, for example, a payment service provider, then they don't apply, like there are no, no, no bank rules to them. Um, on your second question, uh, fintechs or European fintechs doing um, business outside Europe, they frankly, I don't know. Um, I mean, we do have some people also at the central bank uh, looking at um, at fintechs and looking at these, but they're very much at the at the um, horizontal level. So these are like dedicated project teams, um, and they might have some more insights into this, but not that I would be aware of. Sorry. Thank you. Any other question? Fine. So I, I think they have to think about uh, <laughs> all the monetary supervision. And we have Trichet on the 30, so I think they, they are preparing oh, wow. okay. the questions also for, <laughs> for him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. That was really great.